Oh, it is so good for you to be joining us today as we continue this collection of sermons that we are in called God Can. If you're new with us today, I want to welcome you to Believing. My name's Michael, and I am so honored that you would take time out of your schedule to listen to this podcast, to watch this at Church Online, to join us on YouTube and be leaning in to God's Word. Because what we've been doing in this series is working to build our faith. We've, we've entitled this collection of sermons, God Can, but it's much more than a title to a series. It is a declaration of faith. It is a belief on the inside of us that we believe that God can do some stuff that only God can do. We've said already in this series that God can save and he can guide and ooh, he can fight. I don't know if you knew God could fight, but he can fight and God can heal. We have learned so much, but more than learned, experienced so much as our faith has been built. We, we, got, we got places to go to. In fact, in a future installment, we're going to talk about how God can provide and how God can father. There's so much that God can do. But today I want to do some work in an area that sometimes we say we want God to do, we don't always mean it because yes, God can save and God can guide and God can provide. He can do all, but God can. And on today, would you please take note of this? Please allow this to begin to set in your heart. But God can purify. God not only is the God who can save you, but he's the God who can purify you from the inside out. And maybe that process, maybe that work and walk has, has never been clarified for you. My prayer on today in these few moments that we will spend together is that, is that your faith would be built to believe that God can purify you. But also you would have clarity to know the step you need to take so that God can purify you. So this past summer, I got to spend several days in Washington, D.C., which is a really great tourist city. I don't know what it's like to live there. I ain't never lived there. But it's a great tourist city because there is so much, especially if you enjoy history or you're interested in, 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 in government and these types of things, there's so much you can do that's free. Like if you'll just walk, like it is amazing the stuff that you can venture into, you can see, you can experience, you can learn. It's fantastic. And while I was there, one of, the, um, one of the afternoons, I decided to spend the entire afternoon at a place called the Museum of the Bible. The Museum of the Bible is this remarkable place that's only a few years old, but it's dedicated to the telling the story and the preservation and the announcement of what the Bible is and what it has been and what it has done for good, but also how it's been misused. It was a fascinating journey to walk through a place that was the museum of the Bible, and it wasn't just a puff piece on the Bible. But they wrestled with the implications of how this group of people, or, or in this season, that this is how the Bible was used improperly. It was a fascinating journey. If you have it in D.C., I highly recommend the museum of the Bible. But what they have there are literally thousands of copies of and the, the original of these very rare fragments and manuscripts and entire books that are the Bible from places all over the world to show its influence and to show the breadth of it. And some of them are a hundred years old and some of them are a thousand years old. And it is wild to see but there were two Bibles in there that um, took wild to a whole nother level. There's a, there's a copy of the Bible known most commonly as the Wicked Bible. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of this. It was copied in the 1630, 1631, I believe, and... It was a copy of the Bible where those who were copying the scripture, because before you could just command P and print that junk, like, like, or download it to your phone, people had to copy it 
by hand. And in this one particular copy of the Bible in English, it was a copy of the King James translation, one of the people copying it missed one word of one of the Ten Commandments. Now, maybe you're not familiar with the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, you know, are you shall have no other gods before me. It was almost a summation of the law. Don't make unto you any graven image. Honor your father and mother. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. These things. Don't steal. Don't kill. Well, as they were copying it, it wasn't intentional as most people, you know, believe. It was just an accident because accidents do happen, but this accident really spun on its head the meaning of one of these commandments because they get in this rhythm in the commandments of thou shalt not. But they forgot the not. And so when they got to the seventh commandment that actually says thou shalt not commit adultery, in this particular copy of the Bible it says thou shalt commit adultery. Changes the meaning a little bit, doesn't it? Like, I don't think that's what God was getting at. And these uh, few copies of it became known as the Wicked Bible. When it was found out, they got collected and burned up. But there were about three of them that sort of remained in circulation, sort of uh, were able to exist out there. And they have one of those there. And it is fascinating to see. It's like, <laughs> this, is, this is wild. But to me, the wildest copy of the Bible, so to speak, that they had inside of this museum of the Bible is something known as the Jefferson Bible. Jefferson referring to the third president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson, who at 77 years old, being someone known to be a voracious reader and someone who had traveled abroadly and was very uh, thought of as an incredible intellect. Thomas Jefferson took it upon himself to create his own version of the Bible. More specifically, his own version of the life and teachings of Jesus. There was a lot about Jesus that Thomas Jefferson disagreed with, that Thomas Jefferson didn't like. But there was a lot about Jesus that he thought was good for the betterment of humanity and society. And so what he did is he literally took a copy of the Bible and, and cut out some of the sayings and some of the teachings of Jesus and compiled this into this thing that's commonly known as the Jefferson Bible while omitting the majority of it, omitting all of the divinity of it, omitting the resurrection, omitting some of the teaching that went against what he actually preferred. The Jefferson Bible. And I can remember being there in the Museum of the Bible, being in D.C., and, and just pondering over the implication of this because the truth is most of us do not have printed copies of our own Bible, if you will. But we do have practical copies of our own Bible. I mean, you would never more than likely be so brash as to take a copy of the scripture and cut and paste to take a copy of the scripture and not just highlight what inspires you, but sharpie out what convicts you. I, you're probably not that bold to do it as tangibly as 77 year old Thomas Jefferson took it upon himself to do. But practically, you do it every day of your life. Practically, we all, to some extent, push back on certain parts of the Bible. There are clear commands to you and to me that for some of us, we don't like them, so we purge them. We don't want anybody to talk about that. We don't want anybody to talk about following Jesus in that area. Talk to me about this stuff that I do. Talk to me about this stuff that I believe. Talk to me about this stuff I enjoy. Don't talk to me about that that convicts me. And friend, the reason... This is so significant for our focus on today is because part of the reason why we never experience the purification that God can bring, that God wants to bring to your life and to mine, is because we cut and paste when we get to his word. 
See, we will never experience all of the purifying, all of the, to use maybe a, a, a church word or a more theological word, the sanctifying that God wants to do if we process his word like that. Now, I want you to understand right off the jump today, particularly those of you who are joining and maybe you're not a person of faith and you're trying to wrestle with salvation and wrestle with who God is and what this means for you. Please understand that what I'm talking about today has less to do with salvation and more to do with sanctification. It has less to do with what is the covering that makes you right with God. It has less to do with what we receive by grace through faith in Jesus, and more to do with what happens after that moment as we are conformed into the image of Christ. See, because you're saved in a moment, but you are changed over time. Today, as we begin, I would love for you to take notes. As Yes, I have some things along the way I'd love for you to write down, but I really believe in these moments the Spirit of God is going to speak to you. And if you would lean in and not tune me out, if you wouldn't decide, you know what, this, this isn't really the hee-hee-ha-ha ha that I was hoping it would be today. This isn't the build me up and encourage me that I hope it would be today. But if you would lean in, I believe the Holy Spirit is going to come knocking on your heart's door. And as he knocks, he's going to point out, he's going to convict because he wants to purify you. The truth is, you are only purified to the level of the faith to follow. You are only purified to the level of your faith to follow. You see, as you do what God says, he purifies you. But the truth is, many of us never experience the purifying that God can bring to our lives because there are places that he has opinions about. There are spaces in our lives where he wants us to live a way, act a way, be a way, prioritize a way. And we don't trust him like that there. You see, purifying in Jesus's mind has a lot less to do with cleaning up some mess that we've made. And more to do with us walking in his way, day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, following his way that he's called his followers to. In fact, Jesus takes all mystery out of this idea in the book of John chapter 14. In John chapter 14, he is, he is teaching here, but this is one of his harder teachings. And he explains it this way and repeats this idea of following, having the faith to follow over and over and over again. Look at what he says in verse 15 of chapter 14 of the book of John. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commands. I mean, I believe that the spirit of God is actually saying that to you and to me today. If you love me, you will keep my commands. Verse 21, he says this, the one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. He literally restates himself. He's trying to make sure it's clear. And the one who loves me will be loved by my father. I also will love him and will reveal myself to him. Verses 23 and 24, Jesus answered, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. The one who does not love me will not keep my words. The word you hear is not mine, but it is from the father who sent me. Jesus makes it very, very clear here what it looks like to follow him. What what it looks like to love him. To reiterate what he said in verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commands. And he reiterates this over and over and over again. But there are some things that Jesus didn't say love for him was. He didn't say that love for him was making up your own priorities. Some of us do that. 
We will make up what sounds good to us, what seems like a priority to us. This looks spiritual, so we're going to prioritize this. And sometimes I think, I think Jesus will look at our vain attempts to make our own priorities somehow something super spiritual, somehow something super significant that we ought to find and say, what are you d doing? Some of us think that if we say we love Jesus, We've done enough that it's not about the following. It's my it's my word. So I'm going to say I love you, Jesus. And that's significant. That's important. But that's not what he said. He didn't say, if you love me, tell me. He said, if you love me, keep my commands. Jesus didn't say that love for him was being more concerned about political outcomes than you are personal devotion. Jesus didn't say that love for him was looking spiritual. Jesus didn't say that, that love for him was praying really loud prayers. If you would just get louder than everybody else, then I'll know that you love me. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commands. He didn't say that trying to pull other people down trying to shame them because of their following of him was going to somehow demonstrate your love. No, no, no. He said, if you love me, keep my commands. To say it another way, Jesus said that love for Jesus is when we do what Jesus says. Dang. Because I want love to be all like emotional, right? Like I feel that love. Ooh, I, feel, I, I just feel Jesus loving me. When we sing that song, I feel Jesus loving me. When I go to that place, when I'm in that space, I feel, no, 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 no. Jesus said, I can tell whether or not you really love me easily. Do you keep my words or not? Because at some point, our desire has to move to devotion. At some point, the, the feelings on the inside, the wants, the hopes, the dreams, the, oh, God, I'm trying, has to move to actual devotion. My grandpa had this expression he would say to me sometimes, especially if I was indecisive about something, or I'd been sort of, I'd been sort of like unwilling to kind of jump in. He'd say, son, my grandpa was kind of gruff and rough. He'd say, son, sometimes you got to poop or get off the pot. Now, maybe that's a little crass to you, but it applies here. Because I think there are some of us that have been sitting around for a long time. Talk about next week, God. Ne 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 next week, I'm going to trust you there. Next month, oh God, next month, I'm going to start following. I, 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 know what, I know you've called me to be generous. And next month, God, next month, I'm going to start being generous. God, next year, I'm going to start serving. Yes, I am. I know you've given me gifts and talents, and I just talk about being so busy. And next year, I'm going to start surfing. N next, next week, next week, I'm going to start forgiving. Yes, I am. Next week. And it's like, <laughs> At some point, desire has to move to devotion because some folk have been living in desire, acting like that covers up, never moving into devotion. So, and I think today, this moment, the Spirit of God is trying to wake you up. The Spirit of God is trying to say, I want to purify you. I want to clean some stuff out of you. There are some desires, some habits, so, some, some ways that you process that I want to change in you. And yes, you saved but until your desire for those things to be different moves to the devotion that I have clearly articulated to you, you will never experience the purification that I have for you. See, people that God can purify, write this down in your notes, digest his word. If you love me, Jesus said, Keep my commands. Where are your commands? They are in his word. As we take in his word, it enables us to be purified. That's why those of us who live our lives by our own version of our own Jefferson Bible, 
never experience the purification that God has for us because we will overlook clear commands for our own personal preference. No, 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 no. People God can purify, digest his word. They read the Bible personally. And they don't do it for volume. They don't do it to try to look impressive. They don't do it to try to tell somebody, you know, I read, I read the whole Old Testament this weekend. Yes, I did. Well, congratulations. There ain't nothing wrong with that. What part of it have you applied? For real. I read the Bible this year. That's great. What have you digested that you said, I, I have to change. God has made clear and I've been People God can purify, digest his word. That's part of what happens when we hear his word preached and taught. When we hear his word preached and taught, sometimes it'll disturb us. I heard one time that a good sermon really is a divine disruption. So please understand, at least from this preacher, I don't mind offending you. In fact, sometimes I think it's my job to, if it's what's in the scripture. I don't mind walking up into that closet on the inside of you that you keep throwing things in that you want to ignore. You want to ignore your bitterness. You want to ignore your selfishness. You want to ignore your unforgiveness. You want to ignore your pride. You want to ignore your addiction. Baby, I will come pull that door open if that's where the spirit leads. You know why? Because that's the junk that God wants to purify out of us. He has more for you than just saving you. Yes, he wants to save you, but he also wants to purify you. But you've got to digest his word. That's why memorizing his word personally is such a powerful statement. His word have I hid in my heart so that I will not sin against him. What if we decided I'm not just going to memorize them positive affirmations? Ain't nothing wrong with them. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. And every tongue that rises up against me in judgment, he shall condemn. Ain't nothing wrong with these affirmations. I'm like, if God be for me, who can be against me? But what about memorizing some uh, love your neighbor as yourself? Give and it shall be given to you. Heaped up good measure, pressed down, shaken together, shall be poured into your lap. With the same measure that you give, what are we giving? Judgment? Condemnation? Resources? With the same measure you give, it will be given back to you. Ignore the speck in your own eye you do to point out What's going on in somebody else's life? What if we started memorizing the word of God that is trying to purify us? Because it's through his word that he points out. It's through the preaching and teaching of his word, the memorization of his word, the reading, the digesting, the hearing of his word that he points out. And once he points out, we recognize it. And once we recognize it, if we're open to him, then he can go to work. But people God can purify have to digest his word. And people that God can purify, write this down too, do his word. It does not purify you if you know it and don't do what it says. It does not purify you like it can, like it should, if you know it and don't do what it says. You can memorize his word. You can shout his word. You can talk about his word. Maybe you can even preach and teach his word. But the purifying that God brings comes because we do it. We're not to be just hearers of the word, but doers as well. And that is how God cleans us out. Jesus reaffirmed his own thought, praying to his father in John 17. In John 17, verse 17, Jesus says to, to his father, he's praying for you and he's praying for me. He says, sanctify them through the truth. To say it another way, purify them through the truth. And then he says, your word is truth. It is God's word 
as we allow it to wash over us, not for us to didact and retract from it, but as we allow it in its entirety, we allow it in the parts that affirm us and confirm for us and the parts that rub us the wrong way and the parts that challenge us and the parts that break us and the parts that hurt us. Sanctify them through your word because your word is truth. This isn't a new idea. Jesus is hearkening back to the teachings that had been since the beginning. See the book of Leviticus chapter number 20 verses 7 and 8. Moses is writing down the instruction of God for people and listen to what the book of Leviticus tells us. Consecrate yourselves. So you do this on you and be holy. It's interesting. You won't find a place in the scripture where God tells us to pray for holiness. He tells us to be holy. Not to ask him to do holy for us. Consecrate yourselves and be holy for I am the Lord your God. How do we do this? Verse 8. Keep my statutes. And somebody, if you're watching at church online, just needs to type the word and in all caps in the, in the chat right now. And keep my statutes, keep my word, and do them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Keep my statutes. And do them. Keep my statutes and do them. God can purify you, but you need to understand this purification is not on the back end of a prayer that you pray just with tears in your eyes. It's on the back end of you doing and keeping his statutes. Keep my statutes and do them. See, friend, what I need you to understand today is, is a reality that can transform your life if you will understand the separation and the partnership that happens in what I'm about to say. Because we are saved by grace, but we aren't sanctified by grace. Everybody loves to talk about grace. Me too. I'm a grace guy. I try to extend grace to people. When people try to act like there's no way God can accept them and God can, no, no, no. There is grace for your sin. His grace is sufficient. His power is made perfect in our weakness. You are saved by grace. Come on, it is not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. It is not by works so that no person can boast about it. We give thanks for our salvation. But we aren't sanctified by grace. Keep my statutes and do them. If you really love me, keep my commands. Throughout the scriptures, grace is a free gift. But there's a calling to do what God has said for us to do. Not because that's what saves us, but because that's what sanctifies us. And it's not the doing what God says that if we do enough of it, somehow we have earned something. No, 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 no. But to have the faith to follow his instruction, to have the faith to follow what he said to do, even though it may run counter current to what everybody else around you says, it makes no sense to forgive them, but yet I'm supposed to forgive. It makes no sense to be generous when I don't even know if I'm going to have enough. It makes no sense to, to let go. It makes no sense not to make myself in my world the center of all things. It makes no sense, except for the fact it's what he said. And when we have the faith to do his will, his ways, over time that changes us. And it sanctifies us. See, the call of God is to keep and do his commands. It's interesting that the writer there in Leviticus points out that and. Keep my statutes. And do them. See, keeping and doing are different. And what God wants is actually both of them to be in play for you and for me, both of them to be our aim and our work, both of them. 
Because you can keep without doing. And you can do without keeping. See, when you keep without doing, what happens to you is you become a hypocrite. You obsessively know and state the right thing to demonstrate personal value, but you're unwilling to ever do. You're the person who will tell someone online, you better not be acting like that, but yet in real life, you be acting like that. You're the person who looks pious because you know a verse. You can point a thing out. You'll tell somebody they're being they're not good enough in this area. You'll be into whatever. But in worrying with the speck in their eye, you ignore the log in your own. You have protected. You have kept his statutes. But you don't do them. And if there's anything in our world today that people that don't know God have a tough time with, it's people who want to keep God's statutes but don't want to do them. You want to talk about the Bible is authoritative and the Bible is powerful, but yet you don't love your neighbor because your neighbor don't look like you. You want to talk about how important the scriptures are and how we should follow the law of God. You're the type that wants to make sure the Ten Commandments are hung in a courthouse. The problem is you don't want the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God to ever flow through that courthouse. You keep, but don't do. If you do without keeping, you become a Pharisee. And outwardly, you do the right things, but inside you're dead because your heart ain't in it. You know, there are people who will do the things that look spiritual. They will do the things that appear right. They will be the first to show up and the last to leave, but they are rotten to the core because of the bitterness on the inside of them. They may outwardly show their generosity. They may outwardly demonstrate what it is they think people want them to do. They will lift their hands in worship, but yet not value the things of God beyond those 90 minutes or so they spend in a worship experience. They are pharisaical. Because you can't keep without doing and you can do without keeping, which is why God made it so clear. Keep my statutes and do them. See, because write this down. When you personally follow what God says, God can purify you. Not when you put it on someone else, but when you personally follow what God says, God can purify purify you. He can rinse out some of those habits, those addictions, that those things that are so broken on the inside of you. God can purify you when you personally follow what God says. You keep and you do. But when you don't follow what God says, hear me, God can't purify you. That's why some of you have been struggling with the same thing for so long. You've been in church, you probably saved, but like that same thing won't break. There's a good chance it's because you won't keep and do. What you, you have Jeffersoned your Bible. You have omitted and detracted. You love to skip over that reality, but if you would keep and do, God would purify you like only he can. Because God can't purify you when you don't follow what he says. Because what happens when you don't follow what he says is you're allowing the other thing to be king. You're allowing the other affection You're allowing whatever it is that you won't trust to him, whatever it is that you won't give to him, whatever it is you won't follow him fully with, whatever it is, you are allowing that to rule your life. You are allowing that thing to take preeminence over your life rather than who God is and what God has said. My willingness to do whatever God's way is an indication that I'm not king of my life. It's not that I have a good argument for God. 
It's that I see what he says. And I do what he says. And I keep what he says. And it's not I'm just doing this for show. I'm doing this because it pleases God. Keep and do. See, you cannot become who God wants you to become without loving him enough to do what he says. Jesus was always the harshest. Read the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the stories of Jesus. He was always the harshest towards religious people who did not keep and do. Sometimes they would do without keeping. Sometimes they would keep without do. And Jesus just, he, he never modeled grace towards them. You know what he did? This is one time he just started checking them. Like, like, like name calling made me shrink down at the lunch table, made me want to go to the restroom at the middle of, like checking them. Like what's up? Jesus starts calling them whitewashed tombs. He's like, man, you better get out of here with your, your outwardly appearing, looking good, inwardly rotting away, got dead men bone having on the inside of you. Like he's like, I've had enough of this. Because you are doing what it says, but you don't keep it in your heart. And I think the reason Jesus was so harsh towards them, because he knew that God can purify them. But that purification started with them when they choose to keep and do. See, the problem with people who think that they can do it on their own is they think they can make themselves pure on their own. They think they can earn their own goodness. And really, in their heart of hearts, they think they can earn their own salvation, even though that was a gift to begin with. Your works don't purify you. Your willingness does purify you. It is not the works that you do. It is not your ability to follow what God has said that you agree with and that you disagree with or that is easy for you, but also it is not the works that purifies you. Watch me. It is the willingness that purifies you. Most people miss what I'm saying, maybe even you. Most people think, well, if I could just do the thing then. No, 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 no. It is not the doing. That's why you have to keep and do. It is the willingness that does purify. If I could say it another way, it's not the action that purifies you. It's what God does in me because my heart wants to keep and do what he told me to do. When my heart gets molded into a place where I want to keep, I want to do. I'm not saying it ever got easy, but I want to please God and I want to honor him and I want to let my light shine and I want to be salt and I want to do what God has called me to do. When that becomes your motivation to keep and do, it's not those actions that actually purify you. It's what's going on in your heart that purifies you. See, when you're willing to keep and do, God can then purify you. When you're willing to keep and do, God can then purify you. See, uh, if you're saved, hatefulness should not be in you in any form. It shouldn't. For God so loved the whole world. We can just stop there. Hatefulness should not be on the inside of you. But I know some hateful people who call themselves Christians. I ain't going to give you no names, though. But I know some hateful people who call themselves Christians. And maybe they are a Christian. Maybe they are saved. Because we're saved by grace through faith. It is not of ourselves. What is clear, though, is they're not keeping and doing what God has commanded. Because there is hatefulness in their heart towards somebody. Hatefulness in their heart 
towards people of a certain age or of a certain race or of a certain economic or of a certain background, or of a certain education level, or lack of education. There is hatefulness in them towards those type of people. But if you kept and, and, and did the commands of God, you would find that Jesus said to love your enemy and to pray for those who persecute you. Literally the people making your life hard. Literally the people you fundamentally and foundationally disagree with. Literally the people who you wish they were gone. He says, love your enemy. And, 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 and pray for those who persecute you. See, the reason that hatefulness can't be in your heart if you keep and do is because God purifies that out. And here's how. There's nobody that I pray for regularly that I can hate. I don't care who they are. I don't care what they've done to me. I don't care how they've mistreated and abused me. I don't care what they've taken from me. I don't care how they've lied about me. If I pray for them, it becomes impossible for me to hate them. See, hatefulness should not be about you in any form. And the way God purifies that out is on the other side. It's a byproduct when you really do love those who are your enemies. And you really do pray for those who make your life hard. You see, if you're saved, greed should not be connected to you. It shouldn't. The people of God should not be known as greedy people. But I know plenty of people. In fact, shoot, some of the greediest people I know call themselves Christians. And maybe they are. I ain't here to judge. But it is clear that they do not keep and do. Because Christians are not encouraged to be generous. We are commanded to be generous. Christians are commanded to be generous. And the only thing that breaks greed off of you is generosity. You cannot serve God and the spirit that's on money. The scripture writes it this way, mammon. You cannot serve, to say it real plain, God and greed. Because money tells you you never have enough and you better consume all you take in and you better save more and you better have more for yourself and you better not worry about anybody. You better not give to the church. You better not give to the need. You better not give to God. You better not help out somebody on the street because what about you? That's what greed tells you. And there are a lot of people who call themselves Christians who are greedy. And the reason is because they're not generous. Because if you become generous, it will break the spirit of greed off of you. And it's the only thing that will. See, if you're a Christian, envy should not be associated with you. This the constant desire and constant worrying to have what my neighbor has and have what my coworker has. And man, I saw somebody in class with this. I better one up them by next week. Like, but yes, some of the most envious people I know call themselves Christians. And the reason they're envious is because they do not keep and do. Because when you keep and you do, you realize you were formed in your mother's womb before a day of your life had even come to be and that God has set plans and purpose for your life. So I don't need to compare and I don't need to contrast my life and my calling and my purpose with anybody else. I can take on the countenance that Paul said he had taken on where he said, I've learned to be content whether I have more or I have less. It's all right. I ain't worried about you, boo, and what you have and what you don't have. I have learned the secret of being content that I can do all things through Christ 
who gives me the strength. So if he gives me the strength for it, I'll be able to do it. I ain't got to worry about you. And if he doesn't give me the strength for it, that's okay too. I wasn't supposed to do that. Your works don't purify you. Your willingness to keep and to do are what purify you. Now maybe you're asking, you're saying, Michael, this, is, this has been heavy. I know. Next week, uh, God can provide. Woo, come on. But some of you are wondering right here and right now, how do, do, do I start letting God purify me? I would love for you to write this final thing down as I close. The first step of purifying isn't resolution, it's repentance. The first step of purifying, of God cleaning out you, me, isn't resolution, which is what so many of us often make it. We say, God, I'm going to do better. God, next year is going to be different. God, next month, God, next month, I'm going to. And we don't ever repent. You see, repentance is to first recognize and then turn and go the other direction. The problem is you won't really turn and go the other direction if you don't first recognize. And so when we just resolve and say, I'm about to do better, typically what it is is like we go from going this way to this way. It's like minor course correction. Whereas repentance is to recognize I'm not headed in the right direction. And we acknowledge that there. You recognize that there I am wrong. There, God, I haven't been trusting you. God, there, I know that you want to get this bitterness out of me. The problem is I have these three people and you name them. And they hurt me like this and they hurt me like that. And I have said that I'm going to get them back. When you recognize it, now you can begin to turn and go a different direction. When you recognize, God, I'm done trying to cover up and look and try to act like people know. Look, God, I am greedy to the core. And you call it what it is. God, I haven't trusted you with my finances in a year. Or 10 years. Or my whole life. See, some of you, that sounds a little too personal. You're like, it's under the blood. Yeah, but you ain't pure. Because you're greedy. Still. And you call it what it is. God, I make excuses as to why I don't serve in your house, as to why I don't leverage my influence. I make excuses as to why I'm not a bringer. I make excuses as to why I don't trust you there. And you recognize what it is. That's the first step of repentance. And then it enables you to turn and point yourself in a direction where you keep and do what he has said to do. Regardless of what it is, regardless of how difficult it sounds, regardless of how much it costs, because I'm not going to lean on my own understanding, but in all my ways, acknowledge him. See, God can purify you if you will repent. And today, maybe you're listening to me and Maybe you're a Christian who needs to repent because you're a Christian who's not being purified. You're a Christian who's not being sanctified. You're saved. It's under the blood. But you have areas of your life that you are unwilling to baptize and to allow to be fully submitted and submerged and transformed by what God has said to do. And there's something in you today that says in that area, in that space, it's time for me to start keeping and doing. Start keeping and doing. Not keep, but not do. Or do and not keep, but keep and do. 
In this moment while I pray, you can make the first step. You can repent. Today, that's going to be the focus of my prayer for you as we pray. But then after you repent, turn and start walking in the direction he has commanded us to walk in. And watch God purify you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your grace and your mercy towards us. But today I pray for my friends and myself, those areas of our life that have not been submitted to you. We recognize them right now. And we repent. We repent of our selfishness, our bitterness, we, we repent of, 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 the, of, the, of the racism that we haven't confessed. We, we, we repent of, of the, the pride and the arrogance that we have not confessed. We repent of the stinginess and the greediness that we have not confessed. Come on, call it right now. We repent, Heavenly Father. And we recognize that we have missed your mark. We recognize that we have not followed your commands. We have said that we love you, but you said if... You want to love me, then do what I say. And Heavenly Father, we want to do what you say. And so we acknowledge that we have not been. And in this moment, we begin to turn. And we're going to walk in your ways. We're going to do what you have said. We're not going to redact and reduce your word to only those pleasant parts for us. But we're going to walk in your ways. And Father, all we ask is that you purify us along the way. Change our, our motivations and our desires Break down those hard places in our heart that were untouchable for so long. Do what only you can do. Because God, we know that you can purify us. And we want you to purify me. We love you, Jesus. We thank you that you're the God who can purify. We pray all this in your name. Amen.